My name is Peter Wilson. This piano quintet was commissioned by the Royal Philharmonic Society and was composed for the incredible musicians at Ensemble 360 and for music in the round. It's a three movement piece. Each of the three movements takes a really simple theme and plays it round and round like a song in your mind, uh, like an old memory which keeps on coming back in a different way each time. I was really interested in trying to evoke a sense of nostalgia in presenting themes, in presenting a piece of music which upon first listen sounded familiar um, and sounded like a piece of music from your childhood, um, but at the same time keeps on warping or keeps on avoiding your expectations. I really enjoyed composing this piece of music and I hope that you enjoy listening to it. Take care. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, my name's Tom McKinney and I work at Music In Around as the programme manager for our events in Sheffield. And for quite a few years now, we've been working in partnership with the Royal Philharmonic Society on its Composers programme. And the way it works is that a group of composers that's selected annually by the RPS to write new pieces for a number of organisations, and one of which is our resident group of musicians, Ensemble 360. Now, our latest new work from the RPS Composers Programme was a piano quintet by Peter Wilson, and which should have been premiered in Sheffield at the start of November. Of course, that couldn't happen, but we really do hope that we can find another opportunity, another slot in the future to let you hear Peter's new piece in a live concert. However, we do have a brilliant full performance of the quintet, which Ensemble 360 have recorded at home for us. And with us for this chat, in which we'll be learning a lot more about this new piece, we've got composer Peter Wilson here and from Ensemble 360, Ben Navarro and Gemma Rosefield. And I'm going to start, Peter, um, this is quite personal and maybe something we don't normally hear about, discussed very often by composers, but you were quite open with me that you found this piece really difficult to write. And actually, you had a real struggle completing it. I just wonder if you can tell us a bit how that worked, because you told me as well also that that struggle actually entered to define the character of the piece as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think when you begin writing, or when I begin writing each piece of music, I don't necessarily have an idea of where I want it to end up. Um, and it's kind of like wandering around in the dark a bit, kind of like trying to find things to grasp onto, which will then give some kind of meaning to the works that I'm creating. Um, because with each piece of music, I'm wanting to do something which is very genuine to me at that moment, and also very genuine to kind of how the world is, I think. Um, and so rather than kind of try and rely upon techniques or things that I've done in, in the past and recreate these, you know, these old pieces that I've written, I am really trying to kind of find a new way of working and find, um, yeah, just something that is very genuine, I think. And, some, and sometimes that takes a long time. Um, and I don't know, I, I, there was something that I read from Helen Garner recently, who's an Australian author. And she said that with each piece, each book that she writes, she enters this stage of anguish. And she always forgets about this stage until she's in it. And then as soon as she's in it, there's no telling how long it will last until she's out of it. And I find it's very similar with me, I think, and a lot of creatives, I think, in order to create something which is really meaningful, um, you need to go through this anguish and really kind of um, press, I don't know, press into the unknown, explore with things that you don't know how it's going to end up with, and just kind of, you know, try and fail and keep on failing until you end up with something that you're happy with, something that has an emotional response for you. And for me, you know, with this piece of music, it took months. Um, and, you know, eventually, after months of exploring and months of improvising and recording myself, um, then I, I eventually found a few ideas which, you know, when I listened to them time and time again, and I kept on coming back to them and they continually excited me. And once I, you know, once they, once I had that reaction to those sounds, then I knew they were the things that I could cling on to and create a piece out of. Um, but you're talking about the end result there, but I'm wondering whether, when you get commissioned to write something, yeah whether you get a sense immediately of, okay, this is going to be hard. I've got to go through it and I've got to do it because I'm a professional composer and I've got to, complete the, the, got to yeah. complete the piece. But do you get a sense in advance that it's going to be hard or easy? Or does that only become clear once you start to work on the piece? It only becomes clear when you start working on it, I think. There are pieces of music that, I, that I've composed in a day that, you know, I, you know, pieces of music to the same scale as this piece, which I've, you know, composed in perhaps a week or so. Um, and I, I don't know, I think it's, I think that, you know, if you really care about a piece of music, then that will automatically make it more difficult because you're more, you know, stringent with the, um, with the kind of processes that you put it through. Um, but no, it's all, it's all a process of discovery. I think that's, that's the scary and the exciting thing about composition is you have no idea where it's going to end up. Uh, when I first started, started writing this piece, it, my ideas were entirely different. Um, I didn't know what it was going to be. I was hoping that it'd be a piece that I'd you know, be able to kind of just have a great fun with and, you know, and get it out there. But you know, it wasn't, wasn't the case. Um, but you know, saying that, I did end up having great fun with it and I am enormously happy with the piece. Um, yeah, but, it, but it, it really is just kind of, um, I think that as creatives, we have very little control 
over how we find the process of composing each each work. Okay, well, Gemma, so little control over the process and anguish as creatives. D do you feel that? And did you feel that in this piece? I mean, can you feel that sense of anguish and torture in terms of putting this piece together, rehearsing and performing it? Well, it's, it's a really interesting sort of thought because I was actually thinking when Peter was talking about that process that in a way as um, when we're um, learning a new piece or any piece we go through a sort of similar process ourselves in a way maybe not constant anguish let's say but you know ups and downs and finding our way with it and having moments where we feel we're lost with it and then each performance also very different every time you come to do a piece again and again so in that sense it's a similar process what we're doing what we're doing and how we approach and especially with a new piece like this this um that we haven't lived with for such a long time it's even more you know i you could say you go through those sort of different emotions and um i think this piece yeah it's full of um everything that peter just said i mean it's got sort of moments of fun but also great anguish and incredible sort of um, emotive melodies and it, it's really um, we've loved working on it but it must be very strange for Peter not to have heard it yet <laughs> yeah that's, that's the thing. So, yeah so so this has been recorded in advance of Peter actually getting to hear the performance so it's, Peter's no idea what the piece sounds like yet but but no, Ben uh, sorry, no, just I'm, thinking about the, I mean writing a piano quintet um, but as you as a performer I mean Kind of quintet, there aren't actually that many of them, yet the ones that there are are kind of quite iconic pieces of chamber music, you know, Schumann, Dvorak, Brahms. They are, they are real sort of, in a way, kind of crowd pullers. They, they, they really have a great effect on audiences. But as a string player, I mean, you mostly do uh, piano trios or string quartets. How does it differ in a piano quintet? I'm interested in, for example, what the, what the hierarchy of kind of players is. You know, who, who does what in a piano quintet? Mm, yeah, you're right. There's, there's, there are only big pieces for piano quartet, and so I just want to say also it's great to have another shorter piece to add to the repertoire because it, when you're programming, it's impossible to program uh, piano tri uh, so piano quintets because there's always too either too little or too much music if you if you've got an extra piece in. But um, I suppose the more people in a group that are involved, the harder it is, and in, in, in the slower the process can be, wouldn't you say? Because of course there are more people to to to, to um, make problems. <laughs> but um, it's really interesting actually what, um, we really enjoyed rehearsing this piece and it wasn't, it was, it was it, fascinating to rehearse and to learn, but it wasn't problematic in that we didn't feel like we couldn't have a, a musical sense of what he was getting at. I might be proved wrong when he hears it and says it's all wrong, but, um, but it, it's interesting what he said about the process because of course we all go through that. The more you care about something, as Peter said, that the more, uh, difficult it becomes but actually when we received this piece and then we knew at some point we weren't going to be able to play it in the concert and therefore we weren't able to meet Peter in person and and we weren't going to play the piece to him or work on the piece with him in a way we have to sort of throw caution to the wind and say well we've got this piece that he's written down it's completely new to us we don't know anything about his language or what what is what it's about and we have to take everything on face value and rely on what he's lit, written written down and um, that's in a way quite liberating I think isn't mm -hmm. it because you you don't have any preconceived idea of what it's supposed to sound like um, so as you're playing it you're reading it and intellectually you're processing it and you're hearing it for the first time and so you think oh that sounds like this and that sounds like that and so I actually find that quite liberating and knowing that we weren't going to um, play it to Peter was of course before the performance was in some ways frustrating and in other ways quite liberating because we just you know we had to just see and it, and also it's quite a it's fascinating how much information um i find anyway fascinating how much information that composers like peter can write on a page to make a style you know not just the music the harmony how things relate not even just the dynamics but the actual style of the piece mm. because peter's quite specific about things like elongation of a certain beat in a bar or using vibrato not using vibrato uh, having a, a, a an, an audible um, uh, portamento slide between the notes, for instance, mm. which is quite you know a useful thing on string instruments, but.
things like that that one might put in instinctively when you're playing music that's not so specifically written. But he's very specific about that. But it was always very, very natural. Yeah, at which the same time. It immediately creates a certain style, which mm. is exciting because you're immediately playing in this style that you've never heard or, or before, mm. and it's all because of what he's written on the page. So, um, so I find it really completely fascinating. That. But there was there, there was something I wanted to pick up on there. Actually. There is something written in the score where there's a section where he says he wants to be played completely, utterly, and stupidly melodramatic. Yeah. Um, that's the exact words. That's your quote, Peter. <laughs> this isn't me making this up. I'm just, this, this is a general question to, to you two, Ben and Gemma, and also I'll pass it back to Peter, but, I mean, you've said that, you know, there's lots of information in the music, but do you appreciate that kind of guidance as a performer? Or do you actually feel that that kind of, that kind of character instruction should be left to you to interpret personally? I, I do appreciate that, a composer giving you that kind of guidance? I think for me, like, it, as Ben said, like, it's helpful maybe on the first reading to have something sort of so, you know, that's sort of saying it like it is like that. But um, hopefully, probably for an instruction like that, for that moment specifically, maybe after a couple of times of playing it, hopefully we would have, you know, gone a bit down that road anyway. But having said that, it does give you the confidence to really go for it and be really extreme, having the composer just say it as sort of, you know, starkly as that in a way. Yeah. So I think it's just a modern language way yeah. of saying something which other composers did say as well, but in a more kind of constrained way, yeah. I suppose. So I think, it, I think it's useful, basically, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's, it's useful uh, overall. It's not necessary, but it's useful. Yeah. Well, Peter... I mean that that um, that marking, you know, mm. completely, utterly, and stupidly melodramatic. And and also, as soon as I heard the piece open, I thought this is actually a homage to that kind of rich romantic style of playing. Although you've notated it in this way, um, mm. and straight away it called it, to me. It's, it's like oh, this is kind of like hyper Brahms or something. Um, mm. it, even though there's a kind of slightly kind of humorous quality to it as well at the same time. It's like the idea of like the music's kind of falling apart at the same time. I, that's how I heard it anyway. Um, were there any kind of iconic pieces that you based this on? I mean, were there any other quintets that were kind of a reference point? There weren't actually. I mean, I did listen to a lot of quintets when I first started writing the piece, uh, but no, there was no specific one piece. I think, you know, again, that's just a matter of, it was written over a long period of time and, you know, all the pieces of music that I listened to and the books that I read and the films that I saw and, you know, they all just kind of like subconsciously found their way into my music. Um, I would say that one composer, not that you'd be able to necessarily hear his music in this quintet, but I'd say like my interest in this type of music came partly from Scriabin, who I absolutely love. And he just writes this completely lush romantic um, piano music or post-romantic piano music. Uh, and those types of harmonies, uh, even though my harmonies are definitely more kind of toward the classical than his music was. Um, but no, I th I'd say the other thing is also my job until lockdown, until COVID, my job was as a ballet pianist, uh, accompanying music for ballet classes. And so I think just, you know, through improvising that kind of, um, you know, when you're playing music for ballet classes, you're trying to create this, you know, hyper expressive music, you know, you're trying to within, you know, very restricted means, you're always playing in the same tempo. It all needs to be square in 4-4. Four, four. Um, you know, rhythmically, it can't really change, but you're at the same time trying to get as much bang for your buck as possible from an emotional response. And so I started to develop all these kind of like um, rapturous romantic tropes, I suppose, you know, when you're playing, you know, glissandi and, you know, arpeggios and all these, you know, rich chords and very dense chords. And I think, um, yeah, I, I was just kind of... Uh, because of this job, perhaps, you know, when I started improvising piano, then I'd start kind of improvising with these types of sounds and they just kind of found their way into the piece. Um, yeah, but I, I do love romantic music so much. Uh, and yeah, I think it was just kind of, how can I create a romantic piece which isn't a romantic piece? And, and, and one of the things as well, that, the romantic piece, and you mentioned hyper expressive and hyper romantic, is that, I mean, the playing style of Ensemble 360, mm -hmm kind of absolutely capitalized on their playing styles you know mm. i mean that is what they do best i mean that's how they play best you know there's there's no room for kind of modesty in the way <laughs> on some of the 60 play 
and just, <laughs> I mean that in a very, very good way. Utterly and stupidly melodramatic all the time. Well, I'm, I'm not going to use that. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, whether it happened inadvertently or accidentally or whatever, or whether Peter contrived this, do you feel that it's a piece that absolutely plays to your strengths? I know you said that. I don't know. I suppose um, when Ben and in the first movement particularly, I felt you know very very quickly um, the sort of. I mean, again, it's very hard to say because we haven't played it to Peter and he might listen to it and say, you know, we should really have a post-concert discussion. <laughs> I, thought was, I thought it was, when we were, I remember when we first had the first rehearsal and we all turned up and we, and it was, everything's a bit weird because of what's been going on anyway. And then Tim went in to do his normal warm up of playing some Bach or something. And then he launched into the beginning of Peter's piece. And I walked in and someone said, oh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> because none of us, none of us uh, imagined that it that, that was but it was you know so it, and and he was playing it in you know the way Tim does in his very expressive way and really beautifully in it and it's it so that I thought God that really does sound very pianistic and very much and like the same Tim with the violin well. melody as well, and yeah, yeah I suppose there was lots of kind of lush stuff in the strings and everything which we all enjoyed and as I said all the portamenti and everything and all the um, but it's very cleverly written that it's sort of very natural in its sort of flow actually mm. I think particularly that move that first movement, that first movement yeah. it, it then, doesn't feel contrived ever but it's no. it's just very beautiful and sort of just when you think oh I know where it's going it slightly goes away from where you think it's going it's and, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not yeah. obvious so it reminds me a bit of the if you don't mind me saying the Korngold quintet which mm. I don't know if you know that well but we played that yeah, um, cool. in, in in the way that it's not there are always things to catch you out and that the the, mm. the bottom of the phrase or the, the end of the slide isn't quite where you expect it sometimes and mm. you know things yeah. like that really oh i'm genuinely so excited to hear it it just it sounds like you have you know captured it perfectly oh god <laughs> hope so yeah well we'll do it we'll do a post yeah. performance <laughs> session with me. a debrief as well we'll do with peter yeah. well look um peter you've also written um, a really quite detailed program though to explain a lot of the story and the character behind this piece and to everyone watching um you can go and read peter's notes um, on the Music in the Round website in the link uh, below. Uh, but Peter, having you with us here now, it, it's been so good to hear you explain how you compose. We don't, we don't hear that very often. Um, be so honest as well. Um, so thank you so much. And also to Ben and Gemma uh, for joining us as well. And as I mentioned at the start, we really want to get Peter's quintet out there into a live concert. And I hope everything you've heard just gets you really quite excited for when we can eventually do that. But for now, take care of yourselves and we'll see you at our concerts again very soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much.